edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley speaking to you from Washington, D.C. One of the more encouraging developments in U.S. domestic politics has just occurred this afternoon, the 12th of June, 2015. The House of Representatives has rejected, in effect, the entire monstrous runaway shop pseudo free trade rip off job destroying bill that uh, Obama combined with Boehner and Mitch McConnell had been attempting to force down the throat of the Congress. This is a combination of something called trade adjustment authority. That is a pittance paid to the wretched victims of free trade sellouts when that giant sucking sound kicks in and the jobs begin to flow to the low-wage workplaces of Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Burma, whatever it is. Uh, and, of course, um, at the same time, the, uh, the Wall Street fat cats, the finance oligarchs, uh, make a killing. So uh, that is, uh, is ruled out for the moment. Specifically in the details, it's a combination of fast track, which they call trade promotion authority. <laughs> in other words, layoff promotion authority, runaway shop uh, protection <laughs> authority uh, or enhancement. So um, the combination was this. The uh, Trade Adjustment Authority, paying these pittances to the victims, uh, was defeated by a lopsided margin, 302 to 126. Wow. It's going to be hard to turn that around. going to take a lot of sweeteners on that. So the TAA, Trade Adjustment Authority, and again, it's a kind of um, it's a training program, some money for... Uh, things like tuition in community colleges and some other stuff like this. And, of course, it assumes there are jobs. It says your problem is that you're not trained for jobs that exist. What if no jobs exist, which is the current case? Uh, doesn't help you. Now, inside, one of the reasons it was so easy to vote against this trade adjustment authority is it was going to be financed by gouging and looting $700 billion out of Medicare, I'm, maybe it's uh, maybe it's a smaller sum, but it, it's a huge sum to be taken out of Medicare. And of course, uh, this kicked. What this allowed was the self-interest of our heroes on Capitol Hill was allowed to kick in because every Democrat knew that if they voted for that Trade Adjustment Authority and that kind of uh, seven hundred, maybe it's seven hundred million dollar looting. Yeah, there we go, seven hundred million that they would be faced by a reactionary Republican trying to pull a fast one, attacking the Democrat, if incumbent, saying, you voted to cut Medicare. And, of course, for a Democrat, this is uh, grave damage. Uh, even Republicans might have thought about this, right? If you're uh, a lot of you know people are uh, confused and they might say, you know, I get your hands, get your free trade hands off my Medicare. So um, the giant sucking sound for the moment is uh, is defeated. Um, the uh, fun dedications of Obama included going to Capitol Hill for one hour this morning to give a uh, very poorly received speech to the Democratic caucus. Some of them said they were insulted by his patronizing tone. He told them to play it straight. What the hell does that mean? Vote your district is the rule, Obama, not play it straight. And if there are any jobs, there are, there are any remaining industrial jobs, they're certainly uh, very much in danger as a result of this legislation. So Obama left pessimistic and with good reason. So it's a defeat. It's a signal defeat. It's a uh, really uh, humiliating rebuff for Obama, Mitch McConnell, Boehner, the Koch brothers, and all of these other characters who wanted this to go through. So, of course, the uh, fast track did pass, although by a very small margin, 219 to 211. Fast track has been approved by the House. But since the bill, they were voting on a bill coming from the Senate that had been divided into parts. If one part, in this case TAA, is defeated, then 
is simply it, it's a matter of law, not of anybody's choice, that you can't uh, turn around and say, let's just have Obama sign the fast track authority 219 to 211. You can see what they did. They did the votes easily, as our heroes always do. You, you don't want to be told you voted against uh, trade expansion. So a lot of them voted for fast track. Once they knew that the whole thing was going to go down, that vote didn't mean anything. It became kind of a procedural vote. So that is number one. And uh, interesting, um, the uh, the way that uh, this was reported, uh, Reuters reported it more or less factually, Huffington Post, National Public Radio, when it had been defeated, said, oh, there's confusion about what will happen next. And they didn't tell you the vote and they didn't tell you what had happened. Uh, in the top of the hour after this actually went through. All right. Now, the other immediate front from Varese, Italy to Benton Harbor, Michigan, we have the same struggle against Whirlpool. Now, this uh, was um, an intervention by the Tax Wall Street Party to link up, build bridges, go for a united front, as in united front against austerity, uh, with the Italian Metal Workers Unions, FIM of the CISL, FIOM of the CGIL, and UILM of the UIL. Right, those are the three metal workers. Then as you put those three together, you got the practically the United Auto Workers of Italy. And in this case, it is building appliances, this wonderful Italian uh, specialty, these companies like Candy, Indesit, Zopas, and so forth. Indesit was one of the last to uh, to go down, being acquired by Whirlpool. Uh, Maytag, remember Maytag, their, their factories were shut down and moved to Mexico precisely by, uh, by Whirlpool, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, the person who came forward on this is a very big name, and not just in Italy, but all over Europe. Judge Ferdinando Imposimato. He is the honorary president of the Supreme Court of Italy. Supreme Court comes out as Corte di Cassazione. It's the top-level appeal court. And uh, he was kind enough to, um, to sign a statement, to put out a statement, uh, where he draws this connection that we see these, we see a town like Benton Harbor, which is being treated like a plantation of despair, is that, is that what's going to happen now in Varese, Trento, Turin, uh, and all of these other places? Let's give you the full list here if we can, uh, if we can find it. Varese, Caserta, and he's from Caserta. Turin, Naples, Siena, and other Italian cities. Now, why is this important? Imposimato is, I think at this point, probably the most famous and most highly regarded of the investigative judges who set out in the 1980s to get to the bottom of the mafia and the Aldo Moro assassination, uh, anti-terror investigating magistrate and anti-mafia. He was a candidate for the presidency of the Italian Republic the last time around. So this is a person of presidential caliber. And uh, very, very well known, and uh, he very active in uh, politics. He's trying to protect the Italian schools against a very ill-considered reform by Renzi and the PD government. So this is uh, this is a person of massive integrity. So. He, uh, right, just I'll read you just the, the introduction. Having examined a summary of the legal action against Reverend Edward Pinckney of Benton Harbor, Michigan, USA, I feel the duty to express my gravest concern about the abuses of human rights and civil rights against this minister of the gospel. We'll give you a little bit more of this in a, in a minute. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. It's, uh... 12th. So, Imposimato, famous uh, judge, again, honorary president of the Italian Supreme Court, is the first signatory of this call to support the Italian metal workers who are striking against Whirlpool today, June 12th. General strike in Varese, national representation there to keep their jobs, right, to prevent Whirlpool from wiping out uh, 2,000 of the 6,000 jobs remaining in the job pool of uh, what was Indesit and is now Whirlpool, and 
to support Edward Pinckney of Benton Harbor, Michigan, who is fighting to free a whirlpool company town. So he expresses his gravest concern about the abuses of civil and human rights against this minister of the gospel, who is at the same time the main leader of popular resistance against the anti-freedom regime, the liberticide regime, we might say, imposed in that area by the multinational corporation Whirlpool, which has its world headquarters precisely in Benton Harbor. Now, as a summary of the uh, abuses in the trial, a summary of how Whirlpool attacks and degrades and ruins factories, people, cities, entire areas, zones. Uh, so the 2000 firings are, uh, are absolutely uh, unacceptable. In conclusion, we have to ask ourselves if Whirlpool is trying to drive these Italian cities down to the same level of plantations of despair, which we observe today in Ben Harbor. God forbid. I therefore call on the Italian government, says Imposimato, to intervene to protect these jobs in our country. The Italian government should call in the American ambassador in Rome and demand explanations about the Pinckney case, emphatically reminding him that the United States, as signatories along with Italy of the final act of the Helsinki Treaty 1975, are required to respect human rights and civil rights with voting rights at the top of the list. And that's exactly what Pinckney was trying to do. So Ferdinando Imposimato, honorary president of the Supreme Court of Italy and an anti-mafia investigator, formerly candidate for the presidency of the Italian Republic just a couple of months ago. So uh, this is important. Now, the general strike today was a big success. It looks like they had two to 3,000 people in a procession, came from all over Italy. The heads of the three uh, parallel trade union confederations, it's like having the AFL and the CIO and one other, but the CGIL, the UIL, and the CISL, they were all there. They gave rousing speeches, and it was a spirited and militant demonstration. If you want to see some pictures, you can go to, uh, well, go to my uh, my Twitter there. Go to uh, Webster G. Tarpley Twitter feed, and you will find a link to Varese News, but to Varese News on the page that has um, photographs and some uh, video, and some uh, also of these um, of these uh, uh, speeches and the uh, again this march because this was a uh, this is a real demonstration you can see that these guys are well versed in the art of demonstrations actually if you want to see it, what a demonstration should look like go and take a look at it because they know they know what they're doing uh, it doesn't solve all your problems but the ability to do that is a great thing so um, we will be trying to get other uh, notables. Uh, in, in Italy in particular, and as well as in the United States, to, uh, to come forward and join uh, Judge Imposimato in, in what he has done. And we thank him uh, uh, most uh, gratefully. And uh, this, this is a person of, uh, again, massive integrity, massive morality. And now he's uh, at the, fighting at the side of Reverend Pinckney. Right? Stop those layoffs and stop this company town this wretched situation that is now existing in um, Benton Harbor, Michigan. All right. Now, uh, Bilderberg. <laughs> we got the Bilderberg Group. Actually, before we get to Bilderberg, one last thing, just in terms of the immediate stuff. We're getting to the point where the Supremes, the United States Supreme Court, is going to deliver some kind of a verdict on this King versus Burwell. And you'll remember, this is... Will people be essentially put to death in the United States based on a typo or a, a lack of proofreading? If, if it even is that, it may not even be. It could be completely based on nothing. A frivolous lawsuit by reactionaries that the Supreme Court never should have accepted. So the idea is, uh, can you get a subsidy to pay for your Obamacare private insurance policy, can you get that from a state-sponsored exchange only, 
or can you get it from the federal exchange, assuming that in your state, the reactionary Republican thug governor or legislature has um, failed to pass uh, Obamacare. So they're, they're depriving you of, um, of a certain amount of help. Not ideal, but it's way better than nothing. So the Republicans want to strip you down there and leave you nothing but your eyes to cry with. So we're looking, as usual, at the rats cabal. Roberts, Alito, Thomas, Scalia. We have got reactionary judges in there. We've got fascist judges. Our approach, impeach Scalia. Hashtag impeach Scalia. Uh, he is uh, one of the oldest, but he's uh, also one of the most explicit. He has gone way out on many a fascistoid limb in writing his opinions, gems like there is no right to vote in this country, stuff like this. Should have been uh, He should have been impeached for some of these statements he made, quite apart from the opinions. But the wonderful device of impeachment applies to Supreme Court judges. How could it not? So I think we're looking at approximately 10,000 deaths if this uh, procedure goes through and they strike down parts of Obamacare. So stay ready to mobilize. Now then, uh, in terms of... Uh, the Bilderberger Group, we're talking about uh, Austria, and uh, we hope to get a report. Let's see if we can do this uh, in the next um, hour about what's going on. Uh, one um, extremely interesting thing is the willingness of the Bilderberger Group to um, essentially uh, embrace uh, criminals <laughs> they have they've got criminals over there and i guess the leading the leading criminal is uh general david petraeus he's a felon he's a convicted a felon this is not a matter of uh, opinion he has pled guilty to a felony a lot of people would have gone to jail for that but of course not not our dear bonapartist general petraeus and he's got the money bags of Henry Kravis of Coldberg, Kravis Roberts, and you know they they even show up in the uh, Bush park. A father of Henry Kravis, his great friend Prescott Bush, and an early backer, Mad Dog Bush the Elder, George H. W. Bush, whose 91st birthday was either yesterday or today. We'll talk about him too in just a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. So we've done the free trade story. We've talked about the Varese general strike. We've warned you of what's coming in terms of the Supremes, the rats cabal, where we've got to be ready to mobilize big time. If they strike down that bill, that law, that is now settled law, right? They settled it themselves. If they strike that down over a typo, that's going to be a constitutional crisis of the first order. So let's... Um, Let's be ready to meet in the streets, because that's where it's going to have to be uh, decided then. Now, Bilderberg. Uh, Charlie Skelton, friend of the broadcast, has been over there for the London Guardian. Now, this is one of those things that even shows up in the mainstream media, right? But here's a, uh, a person who uh, tells you what's going on and does not uh, conform to the wishes of the uh, the. Uh, London Guardian editorial board, uh, and what what we what we hear about is David Petraeus, as Charlie helpfully hands out points out, a one hundred thousand dollar fine and two years probation for leaking classified information. So uh, that's one criminal. Uh, then he talks about uh, Charlie talks about Rene Benko, Austrian real estate. Uh, Baron, whose conviction for bribery was upheld by the Austrian Supreme Court. Uh, and of course, Prince Bernard of the Netherlands was a member of the SA Brown Shirts and SS Black Shirts. He was part of the uh, Lockheed scandal of 75 to 76, when they had to turn it all, uh, off for, for a year or two. Uh, HSBC. The head of that, Douglas Flint, regular attendee at Bilderberg, uh, all along with Rona Fairhead and uh, the bank's chief legal officer, Stuart Levy. So a lot of these characters are in the gray area. 
George Osborne, secretary. All right. So look, here's the one we always want to watch. Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel, uh, who notoriously was a money bags for Ron Paul, right? The leprechaun, uh, Pellagra Paul, right? Who wanted to cut one trillion out of the U.S. federal budget, uh, including 62 percent cut out of food stamps, which are necessary for the lives, the survival of almost 50 million Americans uh, who need to eat dinner tonight and breakfast tomorrow uh, and can't live under this so-called Austrian system. Now, uh, any number of uh, interesting uh, observations here. There has been a meeting of little Rand Paul, the the current (laughs) presidential wannabe, with Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook and Peter Thiel of Palantir, that's his institutional home, and we're also told that there's a firm appointment of Rand Paul to meet with Peter Thiel after the Bilderberg group is over. What could it mean? And the question we all want to ask is, is uh, Peter Thiel, the great seasteading libertine, is he pushing inside the secret councils of these smelly finance oligarchs? Is he pushing to get big bucks to try to put little Rand and the southern jurisdiction Scottish Rite Freemasons, right? The people who brought you Jesse Helms, Trent Lott, Strom Thurmond, and all the rest of them. Put that guy in the White House. Is that the plan? And remember, there are some people at this uh, gathering who are ultra-reactionary. A lot of them are anti-American for all the wrong reasons. You'd be amazed. Uh, A lot of them uh, actually have uh, Nazi or fascist uh, skeletons in the closet. Maybe their closet, maybe the family closet. Uh, Would that be a way to wipe out the United States? Would that be the revanche that some of these people have been dreaming about? If you put little Rand in the White House, that's revanche a plenty. Lots of Americans would die as a result of those killer cuts, those genocidal austerity uh, plans. So we want to be looking into that. Uh, and of course, they, as as Charlie Skelton points out, if you go to the to go to the group of seven at Garmisch Partenkirchen, um, they treat you rather well, as he writes. But if you go to the Bilderberg, then you're uh, you're harassed. And these are these are actually quite close, right? Garmisch Partenkirchen on the German side, and now over on the Austrian side, that's where they are. So uh, we want to know about Peter Thiel, and we want to know about Rand Paul. And if it's not Rand Paul, then we want to know who else it is, or maybe it's going to be Rand Paul for vice president, putting that guy a heartbeat away. And if you think that's abstract, look. The Republican Party, and we got to just talk for a second about Hastert the Bastard. Denny Hastert, right, the wrestling coach, turns out to be a pervert. He's a pedophile. That seems to be the, the story. Uh, improper advances, improper relations with minor children when he was a coach, a teacher, uh, and a scout leader, too, as well. So uh, he's paying $3.5 million in hush money. Uh, and then it comes out. So, uh, Hastert the Bastard. Hastert the Bastard was two heartbeats away, right, for a good long time, for a good uh, 15 years when he was the, or ten, at least 10 years when he was, sorry, 15 years when he was um, Speaker of the House. No, it's more like five or six years. Leave it at that. Um and remember, Hastert the Bastard was busy in those days. He's the one who set up the poison pill for the, to destroy the United States Postal Service. Remember that they have to pay three years of future benefits in every year, unlike any other business we know of on planet Earth. But with Hastert the Bastard, they had to do it. And it also takes us back to the Mark Foley case of 2005-2006. And then that gets us all the way back to uh, the infamous... Um, senator from Nebraska, right? The guy who's now in there, who was a, uh, a tutor. He was a kind of a, an official 
um, Ben Sass. So all of those reactionary Republicans are heavily implicated. Now, Turkey, Erdogan defeated. This is welcome. Erdogan had become a megalomaniac. It was Erdogan as president and Davutoglu as prime minister. This is outrageous. When you watch all of these long-winded discussions about how to deal with ISIS, the number one thing to do, close the Turkish-Syrian border. Interdict. Barbed wire. Nobody gets across. Not going north, not going south. Nix. You do that. You cut off the taproot of ISIS. They can't get money. They can't do trade. You're cutting them off. Turkey claims to be a NATO ally. Well, I, as a friend of Turkey, I'm very glad to see that the Turkish people have rejected this megalomaniac plan of Erdogan. He wanted to dictate new changes in the Constitution, increase his unchecked uh, power, and uh, he's been defeated with the help of the Kurds, right? The Kurds, the Kurds are, in effect, earning the right to have, if not a country of their own, at least vast autonomy, right? A, maybe a confederation with the rest of uh, of Turkey, if it comes to that, because they've they've essentially blocked Erdogan, and they've done a great service uh, to the uh, to the world public. Remember, your ultimata are: Turkey close that border, Saudis Gulf Co- Cooperation Council cut off the money spigot to ISIS, and don't tell us that it's not uh, happening. Um, and of course, the U.S. should stop. Uh, direct support and the Israelis should stop direct support to ISIS. Now, Obama says 450 advisors. Well, we won't belabor the obvious. This is the this is the language of Vietnam. Uh, probably Obama's smart enough not to go all the way with that, but we'll have to see. So we'll be back in just a minute here on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Keep up with everything, of course, at tarpley.net, tarpley.net. And through Tarpley.net, you can get to Webster G. Tarpley Twitter feed. Uh, and with that, you have everything uh, arrayed, in, indeed, in pedagogical form. Now, um, we're going to be talking about Greece, and we'll be talking about Bilderberg some more in the second hour. Let's just wrap up the first hour, though. Let's talk about uh, the situation here strategically in the Baltic. Uh, And this means we are currently living through here some of the biggest naval exercises that have ever happened in the Baltic Sea. This is called Balt Ops, Baltic Operations, I guess. Uh, Started on June 4th, keeps going, or starts on June 5th and keeps going until the 20th of June. 17 countries are taking part. 49 ships, 61 aircraft, one submarine, combined landing force of 700 U.S., Finnish, and Swedish Marines, 14 NATO allies, joined by partners, Finland, bad, Georgia, worse, uh, 5,600 uh, troops. The head of this is a guy called Vice Admiral James Fago the Third. Well, this is the guy who invented the Fago of War, F-O-G-G-O. I kid you not. So who's involved? Belgium, Canada, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, France, Germany, Georgia, the country, Latvia, Lithuania, Netherlands, Norway, Poland, Sweden, Turkey, United Kingdom, United States. Interesting, Italy not uh, on the list. Italy uh, uh, had uh, hosted Putin in Rome, right? And uh, Pope Francis and Renzi. And the media acknowledged that there's a special relation between Italy and Russia, and there is. So this is a big big deal uh, with the uh, 50... 4950 warship, 61 aircraft, uh, and this is not uh, not good. There's going to be another one coming up on the 9th. Well, it's already going on. From the 9th to the 19th, you've got uh, Operation Noble Jump. Let's call it Operation Leap into the Abyss, right? 
Grand Hotel Abgrund, Noble Jump, first deployment of the Quick Reaction Force of NATO. This is a dangerous thing because that is a way to start a war without reference to the U.S. Congress or anybody else in any legislative uh, assembly. That's very, very serious. Now, you got this news channel, uh, Vox. This is not this is not the Vox we know. This is something else, right? This is called Vox.com, and they've done some um, public opinion polls, and they find the question is: if Russia gets into a serious conflict with one of the neighboring countries that is a NATO ally, should the, your country uh, or use or not use military force to defend that country? Reliably, the biggest fools are the Americans. 37% say no, don't get involved, but 56% say yes, uh, and some of the more intelligent ones, Italy, 51% no, 40% yes, Germany, 58% no, 38% yes, uh, not. So what that means is that the uh, raving hysteria from the German elected political class does not, repeat, not reflect what the average German wants, right? France is also majority anti-intervention. 53 should intervene, 47 not. Spain, 47 no, 48 yes. Poland, unfortunately, uh, somewhat worse than the United States on the should not side, 34, but uh, 48 saying should. British, 37 should, 49 should not. Canada, 36 should, 53 should not. That's uh, that's really disappointing there with uh, with Canada. They were supposed to be sensible, weren't they? Uh, I guess I guess not. So those are those uh, things going on. Now we've had a Ukrainian delegation in the United States this week, and a lot of this has not really been. Uh, publicized. This is our dear friend Yats the Rats. Uh, Arseny Yatsenyuk, accompanied uh, by this awful finance minister, this crazy woman. Um, she's from Chicago, right? But she doesn't have a magic wand. She can't manufacture uh, money out of nothing. Uh, so uh, they've been meeting with Secretary of the Treasury Lou, they've been lewd, uh, and of course with uh, Madame Lagarde of the International Monetary Fund, and we have Yatsenyuk writing an op-ed in the Washington Post this week, June 8th. Uh, the uh, Ukrainians, he says, are fighting against the Soviet past and the legacy of corruption and misrule that held us back for so many years. Well, the fact is they are on the brink of default. They are about to blow. And uh, now they want more money. This is crazy. Compare uh, Greece, NATO member, European Union member, denied anything. And the uh, Ukrainians are this amazing sinkhole where they pour more and more money uh, into it. So... Uh, let's see what what we can do now. Um, concerning the U.S. presidential campaign, we got we got some. Um, we'll try to spend one segment at least about this in the uh, in the second hour. Um, concerning this free trade uh, legislation, though, uh, a guy at Truthout came up with a very good idea to test the metal of our hero Bernie Sanders. Right, I want to. Direct your attention to my contribution to the Left Forum here two weeks ago. I pointed out that uh, Bernie Sanders was famously a creature of the industrial military complex supporting the F-35 fighter plane, which uh, was military aircraft built in New Hampshire. And there's this whole thing about Bernie Sanders and his sex theories uh, committed to a publication in the early 1970s. But the truth out guy was saying the following. Bernie, you can go in to that room and get the treaty, right? You go in there with a little camera, you got it. Uh, they're not going to be able to arrest you. And then you put that into the congressional record. In other words, the 
The idea that this legislation should be kept secret is nothing short of monstrous. It's just out of this world. Remember, Senator Mike Gravel read the Pentagon Papers into the congressional record, right? For whatever they were worth, not that much. But still, that was an important uh, gesture, right? That brought it home to quite a few uh, people. So Bernie didn't do it. Um, a, A real fighting campaign tries to change things even before the election has occurred. In other words, you want to convince people to support you based on things you do, useful public services that you uh, perform. I also would uh, like to point out, we'll talk about this also in the second hour, Hillary Clinton is going to kick off her um, more active phase, let's say. She's um, ended her, uh, this idiotic charade of her listening tour where she listens to carefully regurgitated uh, statements from, uh, you know, screened and vetted uh, stooges who appear there and uh, worship uh, at her altar. But she's going to be giving a rally on Roosevelt Island uh, in the East River, isn't it? Between Manhattan and Queens? Yeah, I think so. And she's going to be presenting herself as the champion of the free college education and student loans. We'll have something to say about that now in the second hour. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Um, The outrageous arrogance of these financiers comes to the fore again. Uh, Practically on the same day that the former head of the IMF, Strauss Kahn, narrowly escaped uh, going to jail for his orgies, and other uh, dubious activity. The International Monetary Fund, as I understand it, has pulled its negotiators out of the talks with Greece. Now, this is coming from this awful woman, Christine Lagarde, or Lagars, as we sometimes call her. Uh, The IMF has pulled out. The other one is a court in Greece has told uh, the government, you can't cut pensions in the way that IMF is trying to get you to do it. So uh, it's now a matter of law. Is it a government of law or a government of diktat coming from Merkel and Schäuble and these people in uh, in Berlin? So without further ado, let's go to our man in Athens, and that's Michael Chiotinis, uh, to see how we are as we go towards the fateful end of June deadline. Yes, so maybe, maybe the, 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 the most interesting thing is this IMF walkout. Um, yesterday, today, today it's Friday, yesterday, Thursday, the IMF said it's walking out. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry, Michael. Well, at least this time we got your, we, we got Pinkney coming on the line, so we got to go to him. Can you hang on? Yes, yes, of course. Okay. So let's go to Reverend Pinkney then. This is uh, Reverend Edward Pinkney speaking from the, uh, the Michigan, uh, prison system under terrible conditions. But we have some good news for you, Reverend. Are you there? I'm here. I'm here, Webster. How you doing? All right, fine. Here, here's what we have. Uh, today, there was this general strike against Whirlpool in a number of Italian cities. But in Varese, they had a uh, procession with about 3,000 people in it. And uh, that was quite successful. The heads of the three main trade union confederations were there, uh, militant demonstration, lots of good slogans. They want to save 2,000 jobs that, uh, that uh, Whirlpool wants to cut. But now, we put out a call in Italian to link up this fight for the jobs in Italy with your situation, that you're fighting to free this company town, Benton Harbor, Michigan, from the Whirlpool dictatorship. And we, the first signature that we got was Judge Ferdinando Imposimato. He is the honorary president of the Italian Supreme Court, the Corte di Cassazione. That's the, that's the top court in the country. He's the honorary president. He has now signed a statement uh, expressing gravest concern about the violation of your civil and human rights. So he wants to support the metal workers who are striking Whirlpool on June 12th and support 
Reverend Edward Pinckney of Benton Harbor fighting to free a whirlpool company town. So we've had this stuff posted, uh, these statements in Italian and in English. Uh, that's been up there now for uh, for six or eight hours. And uh, hey. I think we're causing a stir around the world. So you are not alone, Reverend. You're getting some support. Hey, hey, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Any time that you get support from Italy is, is just a tremendous opportunity. And I look at it this way. Can you send that email to my wife so we can put it on our sure. blog? So I think it's already it's already on the uh, the the, the uh, Pinckney Defense Committee, the CCC. Okay, well, well, it's I'm, already I'm, up I'm there. On, I want it on Banco, so that's that's the one where Whirlpool reads. They read the Banco uh, 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 blog. Okay, so that's that's very very important to let them know that you know, we're we're in, in solidarity with Italy on this strike against Whirlpool, and we're going to continue the protest until we get justice, not only for the people in Benton Harbor, but also in Italy also. So it's, it's, it's a tremendous opportunity, and any time you can get a judge to do anything, uh, especially to sign a <laughs> petition on that level, then you know that you know we're hitting in the right direction. So I'm, 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 I'm happy today, Webster. I'm happy today. I will be able to sleep good tonight knowing <laughs> that, you know, that we have people in Italy who are willing to support uh, uh, our calls in Benton Harbor, Michigan. And we're, we're, we're going to we're gonna try to get more signatures, right? With that guy as, as first, right? He's a famous person. I think absolutely. we can get some others, and they're going to be important, too. Yes, absolutely. And when you get the signatures and whatever you have, please send them to my wife so she can uh, 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 she can also post them on, on, on our website, uh, uh, the Banco website, because right. that's the one that people people be be really interested in. They be they want to know what's going on uh, with the Pinckney case, and and we're, we're moving closer and closer to the time where we're going to be able to uh, go to the appeal court and ask for that bond. So we're we're just taking it one step at a time, trying to get this thing right and try to do the things that need to be done. And we're focused. We're not we're not going to be sidetracked. You know. Because now, you know, the people in Italy and everybody else, they understand that we're on a mission. And like I said before, I've I got to repeat this. A judge actually signed the petition. You know, that's, 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 so, that's bigger than life. And again, it, it, it's not just any judge. He's the top judge of this entire important, you know, European country, Italy. NATO no, member, man. right? Hey, that's that's just tremendous. I, I, I tell you, I'm excited. I tell you, I, I can, you know, this is this is really a a, a big moment for me. Uh, just uh, the guy ran. He ran for president. I, I guess I should have added that, right? He's a well-known anti-mafia, anti-terror investigator, and he ran uh -huh. for president. He got quite a few votes. That was just a couple of months ago. That election is in the Italian parliament, right? It's not a mass election. It's like an, okay. an electoral college. And he was Absolutely. he was a, a real contender for president of the country. Mm -hmm. And actually went out and signed it. It's just like when uh, uh, we had the Green Party, Jill Stein, them signed his names, and they appeared at the courthouse and stuff like that. That was that was you know that's uh, you know just thinking about all this stuff is is, is exciting to me. I'm, I'm I might be at the uh, uh, Lakeland Correctional Facility uh, uh, in 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 Coldwater, Michigan, but I'm 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 excited today to hear that you know that we're getting support from around the world. And I and I know with Australia we had a young man there who who will write me, and I want people to continue to write me. That's that's. To me, that's that's crucial. Is uh, to get letters from Japan and get letters from China and, and different people uh, who can speak English uh, uh, and write the, and understand the language. I'm 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 feeling good about this website, and, 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 it's, and it's thanks to your show. I'm really really excited. Without your show, I don't know what we would do and how we'd be doing this thing. But um, I'm, I'm just feeling good, Web. So I'm, I'm just telling you, just like it is, and um, I'm 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 just thrilled. Okay, so uh, what uh, what else do we want to talk about now? I, I guess you, your investigation of the conditions under uh, Aramark is that, continuing. That is correct, absolutely. Air, Aramark, uh, uh, matter of fact, they are a multi-billion-dollar company that uh, that that feeds uh, most of the, the baseball parks, the basketball uh, uh, stadiums and the football stadiums, and yet and still they sell bad food. Here at, at uh, uh, 
uh, inside the, the Michigan Penitentiary, where they serve the, the, the different foods and stuff like that, and most of it is uh, contaminated food, bad food. Uh, the food is not really worth, worth eating. Uh, it, it, it's really something that people should have to look into. How do they get away with this stuff? And now, you know, people need to talk about the, the system itself and what it's doing to people who have dealt with inside this prison system for 50 and 60 years, even though they might be sick. Hang on, Reverend. We got a, we got one of those hard breaks, but we'll, we'll make it as short as we possibly can. And we'll be right back on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. We have got a couple of minutes left uh, in the time allotted to Reverend Pinkney. So, Reverend... Why don't you continue? We were talking about Aramark and the terrible conditions. And, and here, here's, here's my plan. It's time that we set up, they got headquarters in Philadelphia and Detroit. It's time that we set up and protest the, the food conditions here at this prison through Aramark and also what they do to the school system also. The food is so bad, like I said last week, we had over 125 people that got food poisoned. Over 125 people. We had, people, we had time when they had maggots in the food. We had uh, a situation where the food fell on the floor, and they took a shovel and picked it up and put it back in the pot and gave it to the people. So we have to let people know that we're not going to take this crap anymore. Every single day that we should be talking about. Also, here's an issue that people all around the world can understand. These people, the young guys who had committed crimes when they were 12, 13, and 14 years old, uh, uh, they have, didn't have to be pulled the trigger, but they call them juvenile lifers. And they would never get a chance to ever, ever, ever be outside this prison system unless the people take a stand. They believe that, you know, that as a young child, that you should have a second chance. And uh, here in the state of Michigan, they definitely do not believe that. So that's one of the issues that I'm, I'm really fighting for. I'm, I'm trying to get people to move. I'm trying to get people paroled out of here, uh, uh, commutations and stuff like that. I'm going to be working on a lot of different things to get people moving and to get people on the outside. I decided what I'm going to do is get me about 10, 15 churches, and we're going to go to Lansing. And we're going to lobby. And not only you have one minute remaining. We're going to get a chance to talk to the Senate and the House and get a chance to get things moving around here. And this is something that we can do. But listen, I only got one minute left or less. Uh, those of you who are out there, please go to BH Banco. And uh, uh, like I said, we, we have all the transfer we need except the February 27th and the April 14th. And those of you, you don't, um, let me thank you all first for doing a wonderful job. You have been donating. You've been doing wonderful things. But we, we're down to the last two, and we definitely need your help. I can't do anything. I'm locked up. I can't, I can't su supply any income for my family and stuff like that. But we can do something if we stand together and fight together. So those of you out there, go to bhbanko.org. It's right there. And Webster, I probably got about 10 seconds left. Let me thank you again, I mean, for allowing me to be on your show. I mean, it's, it's a thrill, and I tell you this. And get a chance to, to hear the news that you gave me today about Italy and stuff like that. I'm excited, but make sure you send that information. Thank you for using it. Already we'll sent, tell already me. sent, Reverend, already sent. So, again, that will all, all be available on BH uh, Banco. It's up on the uh, the free Pinkney Website, it's going to be up at tarpley.net uh, and and others, right? So that will be uh, all over all over the world. So um, let's see where we stand now. Um, we want to go back to Athens and Michael Chiotinas. I'm wondering if the control room can tell me how many how many minutes we have left in this segment. All right, fine. Let's go back to Athens. Yes, so... Are we set to go? So, sorry about that, uh, Michael. You know how it is. And today we no, had some, some good news for the Reverend. It's important. It's okay. very important to hear from Reverend Pickney. Now, uh, to get back to where I was, yesterday the IMF um, said it's walking, out, it's walking out on the negotiations. Well, uh, good riddance. <laughs> this, this, could be, this could be an easy emotional response. But besides that, 
it is a very interesting event. In order to see what that means, first of all, we need re reliable information, which we don't really have. And even then, the players in this game are too many. And the whole thing is too complicated. But we need to try and simplify it. There's a theory that the IMF is simply trying to push the Greek government to accept pension cuts and the like, the measures that the IMF is shown to be pushing for. What I see is that the Germans want the IMF to be a part of the Greek program because its methods are used um, as a technocratic excuse to destroy the Greek economy. But the IMF needs its reputation to rebound. And the possibility of a Greek default on the IMF uh, could demonstrate yet another IMF failure. So my first impression is that the IMF is walking out to appear as if it's none of its, none of its fault, which could only mean that the IMF believes the Germans are ready to go as far as a Greek default on June 30th. Watch out for June 30th. That's right. the date on which Greece has to pay 1.7 billion euros to the IMF that the Greek government doesn't have. Um, now, let me tell you a few things. There were uh, 750 uh, million that needed to be repaid in the middle of May. The Greek government seemed determined not to pay. The IMF comes in and allows Greece to take 700 million from a special account held in the Greek central bank in the name of the IMF. So Greece repaid the IMF with IMF money. Then, June 5th, again, 300 million due to the IMF. Greece says, I'm not paying. The IMF ac accepts a request to bundle up all June payments and send them June 30th. That's 1.7 billion. So, in fact, there has already been a default twice, but everyone acted as if it never happened. Hmm. What does that tell us? Can they really afford a Greek default. I don't think they do. Um, and I don't mean it in a financial way. Uh, I mean it in a, in a geopolitical way. Uh, an assumption could be that the U.S. government is afraid that a Greek default could send Greece in the hands of Russia. We can perhaps see a dispute between the U.S. and Germany. Uh, the U.S. wants Germany to be a subcontractor of NATO policy in Eastern Europe, while Germany wants to play its own game in the region. Uh, but, but the fact is that sanctions against Russia and the situation in Ukraine are far more important for the U.S. than Greece right now. <laughs> Greece, is, Greece is important geostrategically, but Ukraine is a hundred times more important. Uh, you see what I'm saying? The, the U.S. You could also you could also argue it's going to be hard to to extend a bailout money to Yatsenyuk, right? We just had Yatsenyuk here in Washington this week. It's going to be politically hard to say here, Ukraine, not a not a European Union member, not a NATO member. You get ten billion or fifteen billion or whatever, but Greece, you you get nothing, and you you're driven out. Yeah. Hang on one second. We'll ponder that for a second. We'll be back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. We've got a couple of minutes left with Michael Chiotinas in Athens. Uh, is it uh, the case that the IMF has pulled out of the talks with Greece as a matter of buck passing? In other words, trying to hang the responsibility, if there is a worldwide banking panic, trying to pin that on Germany. And what seems to me is the Germans want to have this low wage, or at least certain monopolies do, this low wage area of Poland, the Balkans, Ukraine. Uh, they have that in their own country. It's called Hearts 4. If you're on Hearts 4, you're living on, you know, uh, five or six hundred euros plus uh, some wretched little job you might get from time to time. And that's it, month after month. Yes. So... What I'm seeing is that the U.S. would play a soft approach towards Greece. It would try and steer Greece. Uh, Germany is trying to play the hard, oppressive approach. Uh, violent subjugation by political humiliation of uh, Syriza and economic bullying. 
could now could Germany have um, a plan B as a plan B the possibility to um, amputate Greece from the and, and cauterize the rest of the eurozone in some way to preserve it maybe but I think it's too messy I don't see I don't see it happening uh, Schäuble thinks he can bully his way to political domination until the end of June. Right now, the talk is about yet another extension, nine months, with some financing to avoid default and fewer conditionalities, but still in a climate of uncertainty and economic strangulation. I don't think it makes sense. Uh, there can be no more extension of this insanity. Someone could argue that Sometimes you need to destabilize the enemy's timetable. You need to impose your own timetable. And that is uh, that is a principle of, of military thinking. Never let an oligarch attack you according to his timetable. You've got yes. to knock them off balance. You've got to do a counterattack and somehow screw up the uh, the rigidity. Because that's the thing. The oligarch is rigid. Right? And yes, you, if you're going to be flexible, you defeat him. The thing is that I don't see a strategic retreat in these terms as the right thing right, right now. I don't see how retreat could have any benefit for Europe. I, I, I only see an, an offensive approach as having chances of success. Also, Turkey is right now an issue because Erdogan has lost all the, um, the, the almighty status. status. Right. We covered and the, the Kurdish... story. We're, we're very happy with that. We'd like to see uh, see that go on a little bit. Yes, and the Kurdish issue is a huge internal problem for Erdogan. Um, Turkey, Turkey has shown that whenever it has internal problems, it tries to to change direction, provoke war episodes to export its problems. And there have already been provocations um, in Greek islands. But so we need to see this as part of the whole picture. And this gives us a very complicated situation. Okay. So I guess let's let's leave it at that for this week. I think we've, we've uh, done our usual uh, overview. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll, be, we'll be coming at you next week, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay. Now let me just tick off some of these things on the U.S. presidential campaign. Uh, Scott Walker. He is the favorite candidate of Koch and Koch. He's not going to de declare himself until July. Boy, think about George. Uh, think about Jeb Bush stretching the law, violating the law. Scott Walker, that famous reactionary union buster, uh, is uh, is in uh, in another league. He's 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 like the India rubber man. Um, Patrick Healy and Monica Davey. Behind Scott Walker, a long-standing conservative alliance against unions. I have to laugh. When this guy was on Fresh Air, he said, well, he's a conservative, but he's actually rather extreme. He's a reactionary. He is a fascist. Patrick Healy, come on. Stop giving these people the gift of calling them conservatives when they're union-busting reactionaries or much worse. Anyway, you get that entire thing in the New York Times of June 8th. Uh, a lot of uh, detail about who's paying for, for this character, Walker. Uh, the Romney cattle call. Romney has got his cattle call going on in Park City, Parley's Park, Parley Pratt. Uh, quite a raunchy character, polygamist. Uh, they like Rubio. Huh, well, why wouldn't they like Rubio? Rubio was a Mormon for several years of his life. Is Rubio still a Mormon? Is he a crypto Mormon? Well, one way to figure it out is start counting how many wives he has and see what uh, what you get. Then, um, Diabolorum. We put out one of our classic exposés this week. Uh, I hope you're you're getting the uh, morning briefing of the Tax Wall Street Party United Front Against Austerity. Uh, you can uh, send it send in your uh, your uh, request, and you get a free subscription. Uh, what about the the uh, the uh, this uh, charade that Diabolorum Santorum has? He's not of the saints; he's of the devils. Uh, when he talks about a minimum wage, well, uh, there's a you know a, an anti-Santorum uh, body of analysis, right? Some Oppo research online. Uh, 
this goes back to his campaigns. Why won't Santorum help Pennsylvania workers earn a living wage? Santorum has repeatedly voted against increasing the minimum wage. He did at one point propose a token increase, but excluding all the workers, 10 million or so, who live on tips. And he tried to end overtime pay if you go beyond the 40-hour work rate, right? It's usually straight time, time and a half for overtime, and double time on weekends, holidays, and so forth. So he's catering, as this interesting outline says, Outback Steakhouse is benefiting Walmart uh, and the rest of them. And uh, Diabolorum is known to be a crony of the uh, Walmart uh, dynasty. So... Hillary Clinton, if you're going to go to this Roosevelt Island event, Hillary, why don't you call for 0% interest on student loans paid for, mandated, coerced by an act of Congress? Although I would also hasten to point out a real president, if we, if we had a, a real president instead of this pathetic Obama, you could pick up the phone and say, Janet Yellen, guess what? You're going to become an idol for a generation of students. You're going to open a special $2 trillion financing, refinancing facility. Every student loan goes down to 0%. And you'll hear the, uh, the parasites squealing like stuck pigs. Uh, Hillary is seriously trying to tell us that 3.5% is progress. This is supposedly her attempt to placate um, Madame... Uh, Elizabeth Warren. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, remember, had and, and we supported it as much as we could at the time. 0.75% paid for through the discount window of the Federal Reserve. That was a serious proposal. But as soon as the Democratic Party heard about that, Elizabeth was uh, called to order, and uh, she then went back to the 3.5%. The other question, in addition to the student loans being refinanced by the Fed, coerced, uh, is the question of, of free college, right? If you put together community college plus state institutions of all types, that's got to be free. Who should pay? Well, Wall Street. The 1% Wall Street sales tax would be an obvious way to get uh, a significant part of that money. So you put the proceeds from the tax Wall Street, uh, uh, the 1% Wall Street sales tax, that's part of it. And then the other part the um, zero percent student loans, which can also be used to live on, because you got to live on it too. So that is uh, a summary of some of these things. Now we're going to try to get a um, report from Bilderberger here in the final segment. Welcome back to the final segment of World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley speaking from Washington D.C. Now we have a rare treat. We are honored to be joined by Charlie Skelton. Charlie Skelton writes for The Guardian, that is the mainstream newspaper in London, right? The uh, left of center uh, Guardian. Uh, and in this case, uh, he's, he's a, a worthy representative. And uh, he's also, in my estimation, he is now the dean of the Bilderberg experts since uh, he has been uh, on this for The Guardian and, and for other purposes for, uh, for quite a few years now. And Charlie joins us from Austria, where the Bilderberger Group is now taking place. Welcome, Charlie. Hello, Webster. How are you? It's great to talk to you. Now, you know us. We're interested in the ISIS czar John Allen. We're interested in uh, Peter Thiel uh, and his activities. We're interested in how many criminals were there. We just, <laughs> we, uh, in an early segment, I, I went through your article about how the the criminals coexist with the ministers. Um, Kravis Roberts, is Henry Kissinger there? What does he look like? You tell us what you think the uh, the leading uh, points are. Well, I mean, just on the subject of the criminals, um, I just had dinner with a former HSBC investment banker who was very amusing on the subject of their, their extraordinary power uh, worldwide. Um, and they're basically untouchable. Um, much as they get touched every so often by regulators around the world, like the Swiss regulators just find HSBC something like £28 million, which they probably earn, what, every three seconds. 
So um, that's a, that's on their petty cash account. I think it is. I think someone just yeah reached into their pocket and threw it out the car window at the Swiss. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, that's the cost of doing business. But it's it's you know I'm interested in I'm interested in HSBC. But yeah, you, you mentioned Peter Thiel. It's it's good to see him there. He's an interesting character. He's he's on his quest to live forever. You know, he's one of these kind of. Uh, anti-aging people he's he, he finds death really an affront to his existence um and uh, he's throwing a lot of money at that and it's interesting when you look at the kind of ai subject on the uh, on the agenda this year with all the google deep mind stuff and you see people like thiel and palantir's alex carp and stuff and you know there's I, mean, I never quite know what they're where they're heading with ai whether it's just them trying to merge with machines or just try and build something that can some piece of uh, computing equipment that can possibly deal with the amount of data they're mining and 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 sucking up and gathering from all the cameras and devices around the world. You get the feeling that that the uh, the amount of data being sucked up is still slightly too much to kind of crunch. So I think I think Google's just trying to get to the point where they can understand everything. But again, sorry, the, sorry, that's a, the, that's the, thing, the thing that chucked us here was that uh, even though Petraeus is now, uh, I guess, a felon, right, having had to pay a fine and uh, submit to, uh, you know, par- uh, essentially uh, parole, right, out on parole, yeah, yeah. Um, he's nevertheless, he's invited, right? He, he gets to come to this, and they have quite a few uh, others. But now, the other yeah. thing that we're always interested in in these, in these years is uh, – do they express any kind of a tendency on the U.S. presidential election? Uh, do they support the Koch and Koch approach, which is uh, Scott Walker and union busting, pretty much overt fascism? Or do they have something else up their sleeve? Any ideas? I don't know. I mean, it was on their agenda that was discussing it. But, I mean, I, 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 you know, I honestly don't. And that's, that's so far outside my ability to speculate. But, uh, you know, people often ask, you know, do they... What influence do they have in that direction? And it's it's really it's quite hard to tell. And I guess it's the kind of thing you only realise when you look back. You tend to have, you tend to have to look back about sort of four or five years, and you go, "All oh, right, yeah, he was the young guy who turned up that year." So I don't know who the young guy who's turning up this year is. That young guy might be Jeb Bush. I don't know. He was in Berlin. There's that story floating around, but I, I'm not sure I believe uh-huh. that. That's that's quite feasible. How about Greece? Uh, is there a Greek delegation? Do they have anybody from Greece on the list? Well, they do, but not um, not who's actually a a, a Greek um, participant. So uh, not, sorry, not uh, the politician Syriza government. Sorry. Nobody from Syriza. Not Tsipras. Not Varoufakis. No, I think they're the very last people to get a uh, to get an invitation. But um, they're, they're, it's definitely front and center of their of their uh, thinking. Although. Um, I think probably they're more concerned as a group with the possible loss of the UK because from, from Europe with the, the the referendum. I think that's a much bigger deal. You know, Greece. I think everyone could kind of shrug off, but the UK oh. it would be a an absolute catastrophic blow to the to the supranational supranational hopes of these people. Precisely. But I, we also think that um, any exit by anybody is going to start a disintegration progress process. Absolutely, how, about, yeah, yeah. how about Ukraine and Russia? Do you hear any vibes about that? Uh, yeah, I really don't. I tell you what, I've, it's so hard. I tell you, it's, uh, my take on things this year is that I've just, I, I've, I came from the, the G7 before before arriving in, in Bilderberg. So, which is a bit like leaving a warm bath and jumping into an ice bath, and and from uh, from my experience, I've just been at the kind of bad end of the stick when it comes to uh, extremely heavy uh, Tyrolean policing, and um, it, it's an extraordinary police and security operation this year, and it's made it's made it extremely difficult to to report on, and I, you know, it's it's almost easier not to be here. Then you you know it's at least calmer, but um, you know it's it's tough here. It really is. It's it's the toughest policing I've experienced since two thousand and nine when I started in in Greece. Uh, let me let me invite everybody to look at the Guardian and Charlie Skelton's articles are all arrayed, so you can you can the police harassment indeed very very heavy, uh, and and people should read it. So they've actually succeeded in putting a a kind of a 
a, a, a smoke screen or an iron curtain around this yeah, gathering. They really have, and they, you know, it has something to do with the fact that the G7 occurred, you know, not a, about twenty miles away, a couple of days earlier. So it was all part of the same security operation. And you know, the G7 security operation was the biggest thing I've ever seen in my life. It was like a war zone. It was an extraordinary. Uh, event and they basically shut they shut down any possible protest they just they didn't let it happen it was it was a very powerful piece of policing so this is but, this is not like the american one uh what three years ago where you there was you know the driveway going in and you could get within a couple of feet of these participants and maybe take their picture or scream slogans at them this is no longer the case no no this is this is this is tough um and you know, some you know, people ask, you know, why are why aren't there mainstream journalists covering it? And you know, the answer is because it's quite hard, and journalists are incredibly lazy. And I've just come from the G seven, where journalists are treated like the Queen of Sheba, and you get, you know, you're practically getting foot massages under the table. It's that it, there's that much pampering of journalists because the journalist's job there is to eat free food, drink free free beer and wine, and to churn out. The uh, the press release which is coming down from from the schloss at the top and and just to, to do their <laughs> job and just uh, whereas you know here that job doesn't exist you know that there I mean, literally I was I was told you know by uh, the uh, a representative of the German government you know we're here to make your life easier and you know I cross the border and there's representatives of the Austrian government i.e. the police are just trying to make my life difficult so it's a uh, it's an extraordinary um, uh, comparison to have lived through. Well, so, it, yeah, so, so uh, well, it means so it means I'm slightly dissociated from the actual nitty gritty of the of the of the conference because it's just it's such an exhausting process just to just to sort of exist here. And then, how long does it go on? And and what are the what are topics that they still have to discuss? Or uh, they do put out some kind of an agenda, right? Yeah, they put out their uh, their agenda, which I suppose is getting slightly bigger each year. But it's still, you know, it's still slightly meaningless when you've just got NATO on it or Iran mm -hmm. or Greece. I mean, yes, I mean, of course they'll be discussing Greece, but you know, like, of course they will. It's, okay, the music yeah. tells us that we are oh, out well. of time. Charlie, we want to thank you. Maybe we can get you back here next week at this time, and you can give us a wrap up because you know the, the Saturday and Sunday parts are the main parts, and we haven't. We haven't seen them yet, okay? Exactly. Yep. Thank I'm you so much. That. See you soon. See you later. Good luck. Cheers, Webster. Bye-bye. And we'll see you all next week on World Crisis Radio.